Our reading today comes from uh, Matthew's Gospel. It's Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, and it's the story of the Transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and the brothers James and John and led them up a high mountain where they were alone. As they looked on, a change came over Jesus. His face was shining like the sun, and his clothes were dazzling white. Then the three disciples saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, Lord, how good it is that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was talking, a shining cloud came over them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my own dear son with whom I am pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard the voice, they were so terrified that they threw themselves face downwards on the ground. Jesus came to them and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. So they looked up and saw no one there but Jesus. As they came down from the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Don't tell anyone about this vision until you have seen the Son of Man raised from death. Now that story of the Transfiguration figures in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. And all three Gospel writers place this particular story in the same context. And that context is, firstly, Peter's declaration about who Jesus is at Caesarea Philippi. You'll remember that wonderful moment when uh, Jesus is asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they reel off some names, including Elijah. Um, And ultimately, Jesus says to them, yeah, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And that's when Peter pipes up and says, you are the Messiah. And Jesus again says to them, don't tell anyone about this. So there's a marvellous, marvellous declaration of understanding. It's almost like for the first time the disciples have really got it. And then in two of the Gospels, Peter goes on to then say uh, to Jesus, when he speaks about his um, imminent suffering and death, that can never happen, Lord. And Jesus rebukes him uh, for getting it wrong. So there's an amazing high and then an amazing low. And Caesarea Philippi is always followed by that declaration about Jesus, about what is going to happen to him. So there's this sense of questing for who Jesus really is, a tentative understanding followed by um, an obvious misunderstanding. And then we have the transfiguration. And this particular story, of course, is shot full of all sorts of symbolism. Um, We have the three disciples who go up with Jesus, they go up up a mountain, and that's sort of very, um, in the same way that Moses and Elijah both found God up a mountain, or encountered God up a mountain. Um, They see Jesus transformed into an angelic form, so it's almost like the veil of this life is torn away, and they see the end times when Jesus is there, like some kind of angel. And Moses and Elijah, of course, so res- um, uh, so resonate with Old Testament meaning, um, symbols of the law and the prophets. And here is Jesus talking with them as the summation of everything those two people looked for and expected to happen. And then we have the cloud and the voice, exactly the same words that are recorded at Jesus' baptism, in Matthew and Luke at least, um, And so, again, you know, even God saying, this is who this person is. It's all about who Jesus is, of course. And there there are various tiny variations in terms of whether the disciples were asleep, whether they they were afraid, whether they experienced anything at all, uh, and they come down the mountain. And then there is always this sense of not telling anyone. Now, In Matthew and Mark, it's the same thing. Jesus says to the disciples, don't tell anyone about what you've seen. Uh, Whereas in Luke, um, he just records the fact that the disciples didn't tell anyone. And it is, in some ways, 
that final point, which I think is the killer, because it sort of sums all of the previous um, dialogue that Jesus has had with the disciples up in terms of the relationship with God. Now, it might seem strange to say, don't share this with other people, but you'll know yourself that if you have a mountaintop experience, you have a, a, a wonderful joyous experience of something which you find so moving and so wonderful and so poignant and so tremendously foundational there isn't really a great deal of point telling other people about it other than of course to share your enthusiasm your passion your joy and to share that with other people and to spread that love and that happiness but in terms of convincing people that they too should experience that or they too can understand anything about that at all is risky. Um, you may enjoy something absolutely tremendously, but there's no reason to assume that anybody else will. And that's pretty much the way we present stuff normally, isn't it? So, well, well, actually, I really enjoyed that or I really found that fantastic. You can't go on to say, oh, you'll really enjoy it, because you don't know. You don't know whether they will enjoy it or not. Uh, you can just say that you yourself enjoyed it. And I think what the Gospel writers are trying to say here is that the relationship with God that Jesus comes to bring is personal. It's not universal. It's not like saying... You know, the sun rises every day, and as long as there aren't any clouds in the sky, that means there will be light on your part of the planet when you see it. That's kind of like a fact, and nobody can really wake up in the morning and say, that never happened. And Well, they might, this thick cloud, but that's why you have to put the carriers about no clouds. But there are very few things in life that are absolute like that. You know, or you could say, oh, I don't know, uh, if you throw yourself in the sea, you're going to get wet. Uh, that would be true. People would always find that, unless, of course, they went, jumped in the sea in some kind of perspex tube. Who knows? It all gets very complicated. But there are some things you could say that everyone will agree and understand. Go out in the rain without a coat, you're going to get wet. That sort of thing. But there are very few things that really like that in terms of your own experience. So I think what the Gospel writers are saying is, look, don't go telling people about what you've just experienced. Because that will make people fixate on your experience and your experience isn't what I'm all about. It's like when Jesus heals people and says to some of the people who are healed, don't tell anyone about this. Because I think what the gospel writers are trying to say is that then people will think, oh, Jesus is some kind of magic healer. Let's all go and get healed. Whereas in fact, that's not really what Jesus is about. Um, it is what happens when love becomes human and walks amongst people in need. People are healed, people are restored, but that isn't what Jesus is there to do. He's there to say, the right time has come and the kingdom of heaven is here. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news. The good news that God loves you, that God is with you, and always and everywhere you can have that relationship with God. So I think, in some ways, even talking about this wonderful mountaintop experience is to trade the story of the good news, the fact that God is here and love is real and for everyone now. That's the real gem. That's the pearl of great price. That's the treasure in the field. And we shouldn't trade it for just saying, oh, three guys had a fantastic experience on a mountain. That's not what Jesus came for. That's not why Jesus came and died for all of us. It was to make that relationship personal. And I think throughout these three sections of all of those Gospels, Caesarea Philippi, speaking of suffering and death and the transfiguration, we're wrestling with the idea once again, not only of who is Jesus, but why did Jesus come? And the answer is, to bring people into a personal encounter with God. And Peter, James and John had that personal experience of God. They heard God's voice. They saw Jesus transfigured. Well, that's their experience. And how they reflected on that and how it formed them in terms of their total understanding of who Jesus is personal to them 
just as much as your experience of God is personal to you. And when we have experiences of God through the people we meet or the world in which we live or whatever uh, means that happens, those are for us to reflect on, uh, for us to grow spiritually and to understand our place in the universe and to come to hopefully that final recognition that we are utterly and completely loved by the God who made us. That is the reason why we have those experiences, but they're not universal. They're not something that necessarily is going to help anybody else. Um, so take them, enjoy them, praise God for them, learn from them, grow for them. And ultimately, of course, grow into your own ministry of love and universal acceptance and grace and reconciliation and peace. For that's how God meant us to be. That's why we exist, to live in this world and serve and love others because we know we were loved by God first.